Welcome to section 12.2. All right, gentle people, we're going to continue our discussion on quantum mechanics. And so what I want to talk about is kind of the history of quantum mechanics. And if we were to go back to the early 1900s and you were to go to university, well, what would happen is people would advise you not to go ahead and get a PhD in physics. Now, this might sound strange to you, but at the time, we were very smug with ourselves. We thought we had figured it all out. We thought we'd figured out all the answers to physics and that there were no more answers to physics left to discover. We had everything in the bag. Everything was explained except for a couple little things. So classical Newtonian physics described everything really well, but one of the things that it couldn't explain was something called black body radiation. The phenomenon of black body radiation occurs when you heat up an object. So let's go ahead and think of a blacksmith heating up a piece of iron. If you were to take this piece of iron and stick it in his kiln or his fire, what you guys would see is it would start to glow red, yellow, and if his furnace was hot enough, it might go white hot. So this is the first weird thing that we see that kind of deviates from classical Newtonian physics. And that is, is why is color coming out of this? If this was following Newtonian physics, it shouldn't be just one single color. I should get all the colors coming out at once. I should start out at white and not have red appear or yellow appear. And what's more is I don't get other colors to come out of my iron. I never see a piece of iron glow green hot or purple hot. It's just these specific colors that are coming about. And so along came Planck. And he thought about this problem and he said, well, maybe Newtonian physics doesn't describe our world exactly correctly. Maybe the universe is exchanging energy in small chunks of energy called quanta. Now, to give you an idea of what Planck is trying to reconcile, and that is if we look at the world according to Newton, the world is a ramp. So let's say this, this, this is the bottom of my ramp, and let's say that I go five feet tall. If this is the case, the world, according to Newton, says that you can go up this ramp any amount. I could go one foot up. I can go 1.5 feet up. I can go 1.512 feet up, and so on and so forth. There is a continuum of heights available to me. And as long as I exert enough force or energy, I can go up the respective amount up this ramp. Now, what Planck is trying to say is maybe the world isn't a ramp. Maybe our universe is a ladder. And what I mean by that is that if I want to travel up a ladder, well, I can only go up discrete sections in my ladder. I can go up one rung, two rungs, or three rungs. If I try to go up half a rung, I'm going to fail and I'll go back to the bottom. If I go up between two rungs, well, I'll fall back to my lowest rung. And the reason he's saying this is he's saying that all energy transfers can only occur using small packets of energy. So I can only go up if my packet of energy meets the distance between each rung in my ladder. And so this is what it means to be quantized. I can only go up certain packets of energy. So this kind of reconciled the black body problem and we get an equation out of this. What we say is that energy is equal to N times H times V. Now, N is going to be a whole number. This is going to be the number of packets that I am going to transfer. Now, remember, I cannot transfer half a packet of energy. I can only transfer one, two, three, and so on and so forth. So this has to be a whole number. Now, V here is going to be the frequency. So this is the equation to find the energy of light. 
And then H is going to be Planck's constant, and you guys will see this on your information sheet. Now, there was one other problem in the early 1900s that people were having trouble solving with classical Newtonian physics, and that was the photoelectric effect. And then a smart person came around, won the Nobel Prize for solving this problem. That person, Albert Einstein. Let's go ahead and explain the experiment behind the photoelectric effect and what important conclusion we get out of this. So here's the experimental setup. I'm going to go ahead and take a piece of metal. In this case, it's potassium metal. And I'm going to shine light on it with various colors or various energies of light. So let's go ahead and say that I use red light. Now, red light has the weakest energy on this picture. And if I shine red light onto my piece of metal, nothing happens. Let's say that I go to a higher energy light. Let's say I use green light. Now, when I shine green light onto my piece of metal, something interesting happens. All of a sudden, an electron is ejected out of my metal, or an electron is knocked out of place. Now, this is very weird, because when we described light, we said light, or electromagnetic radiation, is a wave, and waves don't knock things out. In classical Newtonian physics, waves have wavelength, they have frequency, and they move through the vacuum of space. They are not knocking things out of place. Classical Newtonian physics say light is in this category of waves, but matter is in a different category. Matter has things like position, matter has things like momentum, and this right here looks like light is behaving like matter. I am having something knocked out. I'm having a collision. And collisions means that I have momentum, and momentum is a particle characteristic. And so what we're seeing here is light is behaving like it has momentum, and that means that light is looking like it has particle-like characteristics. I can continue with this, and go to higher energy light, blue light, and I still see this kind of collision, or light is having this particle-like behavior where it's knocking something as if it was matter. So what Einstein says is that the quanta of light, this packet of light, we can consider it a massless particle or a photon. And this was the big conclusion of the photoelectric effect. It is saying that light has this duality. In one way, it has wave-like properties, and in another way, light is behaving like a particle. This is a breakdown of Newtonian physics, where these were two different entities. Now what Einstein is saying is, no, it has both of these characteristics. And so you guys could see my ambergram here, and you guys could have read it one of two ways. You could have read it as light is a P A R T I C L E. Light is a particle. Or you guys could have read this as light is a W A V, E, light is a wave. And so here's the big conclusion. Light is both a particle and wave at the same time. Now, combining Planck and Einstein's idea, we can go ahead and figure out Planck's constant. Now, the way to do that is we see that our electron is ejected out. And so that means it has kinetic energy. That means we can measure its kinetic energy by measuring its velocity, one-half mv squared, but it also goes back to Planck's idea. And that is, to get this ejection of light, I have to add a certain amount of energy. There's a threshold energy in which this electron can be ejected out, or I've met that criteria and moved up the ladder one rung. What we see here 
is the red light does not have enough energy to meet this threshold or go up one rung in that ladder. But the green light and the blue light do. And so what I get is I get the kinetic energy of the electron is equal to HV minus HV naught. Where HV naught is that threshold energy to knock or loose that electron out into space. Now what I can do is I can plot this on a graph. I can put kinetic energy on my y-axis, frequency or V on my x-axis. And then if I look at this equation, this is y equals mx plus b. And so what I'll notice is the slope of the line will equal Planck's constant. And this is one way that we get Planck's constant out. So with that said, let's go ahead and practice a quiz. I want to figure out what wavelength of light corresponds to this particular energy. Now, I'm going to tell you here, I want this energy for one photon of light. All right, let's go ahead and start out with some equations. The first equation that I can put is that I know that frequency times the wavelength equals the speed of light. Now, I could arrange this and say that the frequency of light equals the speed of light divided by the wavelength of light. And then I can look at the energy of light. The energy of light equals the number of packets I have or the number of photons I have times Planck's constant times the frequency of light. Now what I can do is I can combine these two equations. I'm going to substitute and what I get is that the energy of light equals NHC over lambda. Now I'm going to go ahead and rearrange my equation because I'm interested in the wavelength of light, NHC over E. So let's go ahead and put on our values. I told you that I just want one photon of light, so N is going to be one. I'm going to put in Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joules per second. I'm going to go ahead and put the speed of light in. That's going to be 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And then I'm going to go ahead and divide it by the energy. 8.23 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. You guys will see that joules cancels out, seconds cancels out. So if I do this calculation out, I should get my answer in meters. And I get 2.41 times 10 to the negative seventh meters. Now you'll notice I didn't give any of my answers in meters. So let's go ahead and convert this. This is equivalent to 241 times 10 to the negative ninth meters which is equivalent to 240 nanometers. And so that is going to be the wavelength of that single photon with this amount of energy associated with it. Now, if you think about this, this brings up a very interesting question. And that question is, is in Newtonian physics, light was a separate entity from matter but now because of the quantum revolution, Einstein, Planck, and, and all the scientists of quantum mechanics, we see that light has this duality. Light is both a wave and a particle. The question becomes, does matter have this same duality? Do you, me, a baseball, do we have wavelengths associated with us? Do we have wave-like properties? And so this gets to Einstein's very famous equation, E equals mc squared, which essentially says that energy, matter, light, these are all the same things, just in different forms. To go further, de Broglie went ahead and theorized that the wavelength of a physical object is going to be dependent on its mass, its velocity, and Planck's constant. So be careful right here. This V right here does not stand for frequency. This is velocity. 
I know that gets confusing, uh, but I just want to highlight that fact when you guys use the de Broglie equation. So can we prove this? Can we see matter behaving like a wave? And so let's go ahead and talk about the diffraction experiment, more specifically, the electron diffraction experiment. So let's first talk about how waves behave. And that is when waves interact with another wave. So for example, if I were to go into a pool and I were to wave my hands back and forth, making waves inside the pool, what you could decide is, hey, that looks like fun, jump into the pool, and you can match my movements. Whenever my hand moves forward to make a wave, your hand moves forward to make a wave. When my hand moves back, your hand moves back. We are in rhythm, we are in phase. And so what's going to happen is you're generating a wave, I'm generating a wave, and so if these waves are in phase, meaning that they crest and trough at the same time, what we have is something called constructive interference. When I have constructive interference, the waves are going to combine and we're going to generate a much bigger wave. Now, let's say we do that same analogy. So I'm in the pool creating waves like so, and you come into the pool and decide to be a jerk and ruin my fun. And you are going to generate waves counter to my waves. Meaning whenever my hand goes forward, your hand goes back. Whenever my hand goes back, your hand goes forward. So in essence, you are generating a wave that is completely out of phase. Meaning whenever my wave crests, your wave troughs. When these two waves come together, what we have is destructive interference. What's going to happen is the waves are going to cancel each other out and they are going to destroy each other. And so this is the experiment that we can do with light and things that have wave-like properties. So what can happen is I can go ahead and think of two scenarios. If I go ahead and shoot things at a small hole, the thing will pass through that small hole and hit another wall here. And let's say that my detector is there. Now, what can happen is if I have purely particle-like behavior, I have my objects fly towards this wall with the small hole and the particle goes right through and it hits my detector in about one spot. So again, think of you throwing a baseball at a hole in the wall and that hole allows the baseball to pass through. What you guys would see is that the baseball would hit another wall only in one spot. Now, if I have a wave and you guys can take a look at your lamps or a light bulb, and if I were to pass the light or the waves through a small opening, what you get is kind of this blooming effect. The light kind of goes and spreads in all directions, and it doesn't just illuminate one spot. Now, if you are very careful, you can put a detector on the other side, and what you get is something called a diffraction pattern. You get all these waves being generated, and these waves are going to constructively interfere with each other and destructively interfere. And so when they constructively interfere, I'm going to have bright spots on my detector. Now, when they destructively interfere, what I'm going to get are dark spots on my detector. And that's what a diffraction pattern is. You're seeing light and dark spots due to the constructive and destructive interference of light waves. Now, the picture that you guys see here is not of actual light. The picture that I'm showing you here is what happens when we shoot electrons at a small opening. When I shoot electrons at a small opening, what I get is a diffraction pattern 
and not this top scenario right here. And what that's saying to us is that this electron, an object that we thought of classically as matter, like you or me, has this diffraction pattern, meaning it has wave-like characteristics. And what the electron diffraction experiment shows, or the conclusion here, is that you, me, and things that Newtonian physics thought of as matter has a duality as well. We have wave-like characteristics. All right, Chem 1A, I hope that made sense, and remember to stay safe.